baptisms, the doctrine of baptisms. Now, let's start from Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 1. You remember that's what we've been using, isn't it? What are we teaching on? We are teaching on the first principles of the oracles of Christ, of the doctrines of Christ. Okay? First principles of the doctrine of Christ, of the oracles of Christ, whatever you want to call it, along that line. He says, therefore, living the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, isn't it? Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Do you remember repentance from dead works? So we shared on so many things along that line And of faith towards God And of the doctrine of baptisms The doctrine of baptisms And of laying on of hands And of resurrection of the dead And of eternal judgment So he lets you know that baptism is not just one He calls it the doctrine of baptisms So there are plenty of baptisms that are existent in the Bible Most of us are just privy to water baptism The doctrine of what? Baptisms There are several baptisms It's not just water baptism There are many baptisms And we want to take you through all of them. There are six of them that I want to take you through. Okay. There could be more, but um, to prevent confusion. I'm not here to confuse. I'm here to teach you the word. So to prevent confusion, I've put them into six very important um, baptisms that will help you. Okay. All right. So um, the word baptism, let's define the the word baptism first of all. The word baptism is from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo. And it means to immerse. Okay? Say baptizo. B A P T I Z O. That's a Greek word. And it means to immerse. Okay? To immerse. How many of you have ever seen uh, tie and die in your life? You've seen tie and die. Do you know how they do textiles? Normally the cloth is plain, it's white, depending on what they want to achieve. They may have, uh, if they want to achieve something like this, come. I think this, this is from something like that, isn't it? Yeah, so if they want to achieve something, this address like this, another person should come. Ah, Pastor, Pastor Kobe. You did, you, you did textiles, right? I did in first day. I did textiles in first So what were, how are you doing it? Um... Okay, so there's tie and dye and there's batik, okay. and they both you, you go through the same process. Tie and dye. Is yes. So the, with the tie and dye, um, let's say you have uh, a plain fabric. So for what I'm wearing, it could be green or it could even be white. So what they do is that you first immerse it in the dye to get the color, and then there are various ways of tying it. So when you tie it, you prevent the color from entering into the parts that um, you tied so there is that restriction so when you mess it after that you untie it and then that creates the designs and the motifs inside yeah so that's how they got this and that's how they got this i seeing it uh-huh. the key thing is that they immerse the fabric into a particular color and when they bring the material out you realize that the entire what they want to achieve is achieve the the fabric went in plain but comes out okay it comes out as another color do you understand so when we say baptism we are talking about immersion there are different views concerning baptism you may take your seats thank you very much there are different views okay concerning baptism there's the aspersionist view <laughs> <laughs> Aspersion. Okay. Aspersion means sprinkling. Sprinkling. So there's sprinkling, then there's the effusionist view. Effusion. Which is pouring. Then there's the immersionist view. Which is immersion. Are you in the church? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So aspersion is what? Sprinkling. Effusion is what? 
pouring because there are some people who believe that uh, you can pour a jack of water on somebody and when you pour it on the person the person is baptized then there are those also believe in sprinkling baptism by sprinkling you just sprinkle some water you put your hand in some water and then you sprinkle it on the person the person is baptized okay now both aspersion and effusion are old testament uh, forms of baptisms or washings both of this are all in the old testament the first person who brought a mention is john the baptist and is the new testament concept of baptism so john b jb eh? do you know jb john the baptist john the baptist is the one who the first person who brought baptism by immersion but before then aspersion and infusion was what was used in the old testament hallelujah so the bible talks about the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of abel the blood was sprinkled it was sprinkled there was water that was sprinkled as well then there was water that was poured there were different washings of the old testament look at hebrew chapter uh, 9 verse 10 different very various types of um, baptisms or washings okay he says which stood in the meat in meats and drinks and diverse washings he was, he's talking about the old testament and what they did go go to verse verse uh, eight and let's see hebrews 9 from verse 8 the holy ghost is this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure verse 9 which was a figure of then of the then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience verse 10 it says which stood only in meats the old testament and the sacrifices they made was only in in the form of meats and drinks and diverse washings the word washings there is baptismos okay which is the same word that is used in hebrews chapter 6 where it says the doctrine of baptisms the word baptism there is baptismus. It's just like baptizo, but this, this time around, different spelling. It means washings. Washing. So there were various baptisms in the Old Testament. You see, and he says, and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. What is the time of Reformation? The time of Reformation is the new birth, the time of the new birth, the time of grace. That is the time we are in now. Since before then, the, the, everything stood in various things meats, drinks, diverse washings, and all those things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you in the church? Yeah. Okay, look at Mark. Go to Mark chapter 7. Like I said, I'm going to take you through the scriptures. I'm going to quote a lot of scriptures for you. Okay? Mark chapter 7 from verse 2 to verse 4. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled and defiled hands, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. That is the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders verse 4 and when they come from the market except they wash they eat not and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables <laughs> so all these were things that baptism they used to baptize the pots the cups the brazen the, uh, table they used to baptize themselves in different ways in different forms so baptism is not new it's been in the Old Testament, but Paul was trying to let them know that, listen, leave the, the baptisms of the old and come into the baptisms of the new. That is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Leave that one and come to the baptisms of the new. Because there's something, there's a new and living way. Because the object of all that you are doing is Christ. And Christ has come. So there's no reason why you should leave Christ. Remember he was writing to Hebrews. They were all Jews. And so they knew about the Old Testament washings. And he's trying to convince them to leave that one and come into the new. I see what I'm talking about. Look at the next verse. So Jesus said unto them, Then the Pharisees asked and scribes asked him, Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well, as I, as I have said, as I have prophesied of, of you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honored me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So all that they were doing was lip service. Their heart was not with God. Jesus didn't mean words at all. Jesus was very bold. He used to talk roughly. I mean, it's not a small thing. When he talks to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he calls them, ye brood of vipers. Your father is the devil. Have you ever read that in your Bible? Look at the next verse, verse 7. 
How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So he called them the commandments of men. Next verse. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as a washing of pots. So he called it the traditions of men. The washing of pots and of cups and many other such like things ye do. Hallelujah. So the reality has come and the reality is Christ. Christ is the object of the whole of the Old Testament. So all the things that we are going to talk about is Christ centered. Okay? I hear. So that is basically what baptism is. Now there are six kinds of baptisms. Six kinds. Do you understand what baptism is now? Yes, baptism means to, what? to immerse. So we are not talking about sprinkling or pouring, which are all Old Testament related. We are talking about the New Testament one introduced by John the Baptist, which is what? Immersion. Okay? So if you are baptized by sprinkling, you have not been baptized. If you are baptized by pouring, you have not been baptized. You need to be immersed into something. Hallelujah. So six kinds of baptisms. Let me just name them and then we'll go through all of them one by one. Okay. The first one is John's baptism. John's baptism. The second one is baptism into Christ. Baptism into Christ. The third one, what do you think the third one is? Is water baptism. The fourth one, what do you think is the fourth one? Holy Ghost baptism. The fifth one is baptism into his sufferings. Baptism into his sufferings. Then the sixth one is baptism of fire. Baptism of fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, John's baptism, baptism into Christ, water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism, baptism into his sufferings, baptism of fire. So I'm going to pick it one by one and go through every one of them. Now, in order to understand baptism very, very well, there are four very important things you need to understand. Okay? In order for you not to be confused. So, four very important things you need to understand when it comes to baptism, in order to understand baptism very well. The first one is the baptizer. You need to understand the baptizer, who it is that is doing the baptism. Okay? The second one is the baptizee or the one who is being baptized. You understand? Then the third one is the medium of baptism. What is the medium by which the baptism is being achieved? Is it water? Is it fire? Is it sufferings? Is it death? Is it what is it? Do you get it? Then the fourth one is what it is on to. Or into what are they baptized onto or into? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The baptizer is the one who does the baptism. The baptizee is the one who is baptized. The medium of baptism is the substance that is used, or the element that is used to do the baptism. And then the unto is what the person is brought into by virtue of the baptism. Do you understand? Alright, so let's pick John's baptism and understand John's, John's baptism. Remember all of these things, okay? So let me not clean this one so that every time we complete a particular baptism, I'll ask you who is the baptizer, who is the baptizee, who is the medium, what is the medium and unto what is the person baptized, okay? So the first one is what? John's baptism and it's found in Matthew chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 11 Matthew 3 from verse 1 to verse 11 let's start reading it 
and then we understand what exactly it means. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, repent ye. The word repent here is metanoio, which means a change of mind. You remember metanoio and metanoia are the same thing, isn't it? So he says, and he, he came saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Keep these things in mind. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Next verse. For this is he that was spoken of by, by the prophet Isaiah saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Verse 4. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. The guy was very wild. He grew up in the, in the desert. Then went out to him, up to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region about Jordan. Everybody went to him to be baptized, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Next verse. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers. John the Baptist was just like Jesus. Like Jesus. He also started blasting them. He went to repentance. So if the people are coming, why are you insulting them now? Because they didn't understand what he was doing. He needed to correct them. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Metanoia. This one is metanoia. Bring forth fruit that is equal to the fact that you have really changed your mind. If you claim that you are coming to my baptism, then why do you still do the things that you are doing? Do you understand? Because what my baptism is for you to change your mind towards something. I'm going to show you. Next verse. Verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones, say these stones, these stones to raise up children unto, him, unto, unto Abraham. There were some stones that were in Jordan, that was placed in there by Joshua. And John the Baptist was standing on those rocks, those stones, doing the baptism at Jordan. Let me show you to you, it's in, Je- in Joshua chapter 3. Okay, let's read Joshua chapter 4 rather. Let's read from verse 1. And it came to pass when all the people were clean paths over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them saying, Take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. So the, the priests, they didn't enter, if you read chapter, chapter 3, I wanted us to read from there, but let me just tell you the story. Israel was now going to cross the river Jordan to go to the other side of town to take Canaan. Okay? Now, before they cross, the whole country was going to cross. About 2 million people or 3 million people were going to cross a river. And they needed, they, didn't, they couldn't build a bridge. So what God told, told them was that the priests should put the Ark of Covenant on their shoulders and stand on the shores. In, they should stand in the water. When they stand in the water, the water will divide. And when they stood in the water, the water actually did divide. They had it. So Israel had two water divisions for them. The Red Sea divided for them, and Jordan also divided for them. So Jordan parted into two. At that time, the Bible mentions that at that time, the Jordan used to overflow its banks. So they couldn't go into, into it into details. They just went to the shores, a little bit into the shores, stood on some stones, and then the river parted. Okay? Now, after the river had parted, God told them to take 12 stones from where the priest's legs were. Okay? Out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. 12 stones and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Next verse. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had prepared. So he called them. They came to come and take the 12 stones. After taking the 12 stones from the river, they set it up as an altar. Okay? Then they took 12 stones from the shore and went to replace them in the water. Verse 6. He says that this, is, this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, say, What meaning these stones? That is the stones outside. They took them and brought them outside. So they, they set it as a, up as an altar to be a testimony for them. Then you shall answer them that the, the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So it was there. It was always there. Next verse. And the children of Israel did so. 
Go to the next verse, verse 9. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan. Have you seen it? Yeah. So he set up, after taking 12 out, he set up another 12 in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood. And they are there unto this day. Okay. I say it. Yeah. So 12 were taken out and 12 were put in. And John the Baptist was, was standing on the 12 because John the Baptist is actually a priest. John the Baptist's father was a priest, Zachariah. Okay, and John the Baptist was a sign of the end of the law and the prophets. He, the Bible, Jesus called him. Jesus said that out of all the prophets that have come, there's none that is greater as compared to uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the last because he was going to introduce God on the scene. He was the one who was given the opportunity to introduce God on the scene. Are you listening to me? Yeah. yeah, so he had a very special ministry. But at that time, the priesthood service was corrupted. So God didn't let him go through that side. He made him go through a desert. And come out of the desert to come and proclaim the coming of the Lord. Remember, John the Baptist said that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When we say something is at hand, what it means is that it is here. When we say it's at hand, it doesn't mean that it's coming. It is here. So John the Baptist said that repent because the kingdom of heaven is here. Okay? And he was initiating it. He was bringing in the one who will bring the, the new covenant. Are you in the church? Yeah. So as he stood on the stones baptizing and he saw the Pharisees coming, doing to know. He said that, listen, you people don't say that you are the, you are the children of Abraham. You are prepared already for the coming of the Messiah. You are not. You need to come and do this baptism with a clean heart and change your mind concerning your customs and the things that you do. If you don't change, God is able to raise these stones that I'm standing on, these stones. Okay? He's able to raise children. And thinking not that here within yourselves we have Abraham to our father. For I, I say unto you that God is able to of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And God has done it. This particular scripture has been fulfilled. Who were the stones? The stones were it was on it was, the stones were found on Gentile land. Je, uh, jo, uh, uh, they crossed the Jordan to Jericho. When you cross the Jordan, you go to Jericho. Okay. Now they took the stones from Gentile land. The stones represent Gentiles. Gentiles are dead to God. If you read Ephesians chapter 2, he says that at that time you were godless, you were without God, you were not part of the commonwealth of Israel. You didn't know God at all. So the Gentiles were considered dead. But God brought those stones into the river and those stones have become living stones now by virtue of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Are you saying it? So what John the Baptist baptism was all about was this, that listen, you're all the things that you have been doing in the rituals of the Old Testament, sacrificing and all those things, it means nothing. It cannot save you. It cannot help you get into the kingdom of heaven. The only thing that is good for all of Israel is death. All of you need to come and come and die like these stones came into, the stones were found in the river and then were taken out of the river. You have to be immersed in the river and then brought out. The stones that were in there were taken now to become stones outside. They were resurrected. And then the stones that were in there had to come and die. So what he's saying is that, listen, you guys need to come and die and wait for the coming of the Christ. That was what he was doing. That was John's ministry. Are you listening to me? Uh -huh. That was all that John the Baptist was saying. And John the Baptist said to them that you must come for my baptism to repent for the coming of Christ. Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to verse 4. Acts 19 from verse 1 to verse 4. John's baptism is very simple. It's not complicated at all. Now, our water baptism is not John's baptism. John's baptism is not the baptism that we go through when we are baptized in water. The day we, be, uh, the day we, we have baptism. Do you understand? Because we are not the Israelites. And we are not baptized unto repentance to wait for Christ. Are you here? Yeah. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he asked, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Verse 3. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? Unto what then? Have you seen he's asking the word, Unto what? Because baptism, you must be baptized unto something. So unto what then were you baptized? And he said, Unto John's baptism. We were baptized unto John. 
Then he explained to them and said that in, in other words, these twelve they were twelve guys, twelve disciples, but they had not they had not experienced Jesus Christ. They had only experienced John's baptism. Then Paul explained to them, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. So John's baptism is called the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. Have you seen it? Yeah. So this is John's baptism. John's baptism is the baptism of repentance. Uh, Baptism of repentance unto waiting for the coming Christ. Are you here? Now, if you if if you remember when we're reading Matthew chapter three, the Bible says that they came baptized, they were baptized and they were confessing their sins. Do you remember? They were confessing their sins. Why were they confessing their sins? They were, the word confessing there is oaks homologia, okay, which means to to say in unison, to say in agreement concerning what the preacher is saying. In other words, the preacher is saying that all that you people have been doing since time immemorial is not correct. Just come and come and agree that what I'm saying is, is true. And if you say what I'm saying is true, then you can be baptized by my baptism and hence change your mind. It's a confirmation that you have changed your mind that all of that will not bring you life. The only one who will bring you life is Christ, the Messiah who is coming. So it's John's baptism is very, very simple. It's called the baptism of repentance to wait for the coming Christ. Confessing your sin or confessing in same unison as the preacher was saying, which is to wait for the coming Christ. So all of Israel went to John's baptism because they needed to be prepared for the coming of the Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so who is the baptizer in John's baptism? The baptizer is John. That's why it's called John the Baptist. Who are the baptizees? All of Israel. All of Israel are the baptizees. What is the medium? Water. Isn't it? Unto what were they baptized? Unto what were they baptized? They were baptized unto repentance to wait for repentance awaiting Christ. Is it difficult to understand? So this is how John's baptism is. John came baptizing all of Israel. All of Israel. To wait for the coming Christ. That's why he's called the one who prepares the way of the master. Does it make sense for you? All right. So if you experience John's baptism and you've not received Christ, you are not you just agreed that Christ is coming. You never received him. That is why when, when Paul met the 12 guys who were only baptized by John's baptism, he said that you guys need to... So, okay, go back to Acts chapter 19. Let's read verse 4 now. Then said Paul, John verily baptized the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, next verse, verse 4, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That phrase in the name, I'll explain it to you, but it means to be baptized into Christ. Okay? They were baptized in the name of the Lord. In other words, they received Christ, and then he laid his hands on them and prayed for them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Next verse, verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Please, do you understand John's baptism? It's very simple. It's not complicated at all. See, it's not complicated at all. All right, so let's go to the next one. I want us to go through it quickly. Who doesn't understand? So John's baptism said, change your mind concerning your efforts to know God. Book the customs and you are only good for death. Confess your sins. So come change your mind to the coming of Christ. Who shall lead you into life and into the kingdom of heaven? Who shall lead you into life and into the kingdom of heaven? So that was John's baptism. Waiting. So that was why a lot of Israelites followed Jesus. Because they had gone through John's baptism. There was a day some of the Pharisees came to Jesus and asked him, Who, where do you get your authority from? Then Jesus knew that they were going to, they were trying to catch him with his words. So he also asked them a question. John's baptism, where is it from? Was it from God or what was it from? Where the, where, what's John's baptism? Where is it from? And the Bible says that they could not say anything. They could not answer because if they say that John's baptism was not from God, the whole of Israel would beat them and kill them. 
Meanwhile, John didn't go through the natural system of going through uh, the Levi, Le- Levitical order and all that to become a Pharisee and all that. He was, he was a baby and giant like he just went to a desert and came. So his authority didn't come from them. Yeah. However, his baptism was genuine. All of Israel knew. So Jesus was trying to say, if John's baptism is genuine and it didn't come from you, why are you asking me questions concerning where my authority comes from? <laughs> are you seeing it? Yeah. 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 They knew. That is Matthew chapter 21, verse 25. Then ba- the battle of John, where was it? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not believe then <laughs> believe him then? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people for all old John as a prophet, they all know. Everybody knows because everybody went there. The Bible says that all of Judea went to John the Baptist to be baptized. He was a very powerful man of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His ministry lasted for six months, but it was six months full of a lot of work. So the next one we want to look at is the baptism into Christ, right? Baptism number two. Baptism into Christ. Baptism into Christ. Baptism into Christ. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. It's also called the one baptism. Okay? The one baptism. One lo- let, Okay, let's read from verse, verse 3. Okay, verse 4. It's okay. It says, There's one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. He says, We all participate in one baptism. And that baptism is a baptism into Christ. Now, the day you become born again, that day, if you if you remember Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and verse 10. The Bible, go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and verse 10. The Bible says that, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Have you seen it? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Isn't it? Yeah. So the day you become born again, you receive Christ into you. How do you receive Christ into you? You receive Christ into you by faith, by believing the fact that he did die on your behalf, and he was buried on your behalf, and he rose again from the dead on your behalf. Are you seeing it? Uh huh. So if you read in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse, verse 8, it says, For by grace I saved through faith. By grace I saved through what? Faith. So salvation is by faith. It's grace by faith. It is, it is by grace for by grace. By the work, grace means the work of God. It is by the gr- grace of God, but then through faith. This is through faith that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Do you understand? Uh-huh. But how does, how are we also in Christ? Because we read in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ. So how do we end up in Christ? The first one is for Christ to come into us. The second one is for us to be in Christ. For Christ to come into us, we need faith. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, 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 Romans, if you go, to, let's go to Romans chapter 3. I hope I'm not quoting too many scriptures. I'm just trying to explain things to you. Romans chapter 3, let's read from verse 20. Wherefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is made manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Have you seen it? Which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. It is by faith. So by faith, Christ comes into us. So how, by what means are we immersed into Christ? Are we put into Christ? We are immersed into Christ by baptism. Not water baptism. When I say baptism, don't only think about water. It's just one kind. There are other kinds. And that's what I'm trying to let you understand. So there's a a baptism called the baptism into Christ. Okay? So at the new birth, that's what I'm trying to explain to you now. At the new birth, there are two things that happen. The Holy Spirit is the womb in which a child of God is born. Is born from. The Spirit of God acts as the egg or the womb. The Word of God acts as the seed. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says that being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of, inco- of incorruptible, by the Word of God that lives and abides forever. So the Word of God acts as seed. The word seed is sperma, a sperm. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the is the womb that the sperm of God's word fertilizes. 
That is why in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said that except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you remember? Jesus answered, said, very, very unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Jesus answered, very, very unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What is the water? The water is the word of God. Jesus said, you are cleansed through the word that I have spoken unto you. Okay, so the word of God is the water that Jesus was talking about. Are you here? So, the word of God fertilizes the ovaries of the spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives birth to you. And that is the born again experience. Are you seeing it? That, so, when it gives birth to you, just like a, a, a baby is born out of the womb of the mother into the world, the Holy Spirit also gives birth to you into the body of Christ. So the act of immersing you, so the world in which you have come into as a child of God is called the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Are you here? Yeah. So the baptism of Christ is the immersion of the Holy Spirit of a believer into the body of Christ. Second, First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and verse 13. Look at it. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, be many are one body, so also is Christ. Then verse 13 says, For by one spirit, say by one spirit. spirit. Say it again, by one spirit. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. Next verse. For the body is not one member, but many. So we are made members of the body of Christ through the agency of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who baptizes us into the body of Christ. How does it do it? By giving birth to us. The new birth automatically pushes you into the body of Christ. How do you experience the new birth? By faith. So by faith, Christ comes into you. But by baptism, Christ, you are immersed into the body of Christ. That's why I say that for by one spirit are we all immersed, are we all baptized into one body. Are you seeing it? That is called our one baptism. Every child of God is immersed into the body of Christ. So you can be a cell in the, in the body of Christ. You can be a little finger. You can be a little toe. You can be a small part of the heart. You can be a tissue, a cell, or organ, or a organ or organ system in the body of Christ. All of us form part of the body of Christ. So go to verse 27. Same book, same chapter, verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. How do we become the body of Christ? Through baptism. Are you here? So we are made members of the body through the baptism of the spirit. The spirit of God immerses us into the body of Christ. Now, there are three words you need to understand. The first one is substitution. Then the second one is identification. The third one is baptism. Substitution means Christ died for me. For, for me, on my behalf. I was substituted with him. Identification means Christ died with me. Okay? No, Christ died as me. I'm identified with him. Identification was by laying on of hands. John the Baptist was going to lay hands on Jesus and immerse him into the water. By laying hands on Jesus, John the Baptist, who was a priest and from the Levitical priesthood, was going to transfer his priesthood to Jesus Christ, who was from the tribe of Judah. So John was going to identify, Jesus was going to be identified with priesthood by virtue of a priest who was called John the Baptist. Through laying on of hands. And then through laying on of hands, Jesus was also going to, a lot of things happened at the baptism of Jesus. Jesus was also, was also going to turn into the lamb of God that was going to be used to sacrifice for the, for the like, sins of the whole world. So when John the Baptist, lay, for instance, in the Old Testament, the high priest would lay hands on uh, a bullock for the whole of Israel. And when he lays hands on the bullock, the sins of Israel are transferred from the priest to the bullock. And that bullock is killed and sacrificed to God. When that happens, they say that Israel is saved. Then the blood is taken into the Holy of Holies. It is sprinkled on the mercy seat. And God declares Israel righteous for one year. How were they transferring their sins to the animal through laying on of hands. When they lay hands on the animal, they identify with the animal. Their sin is imparted to the animal, and the animal's innocence is imparted to them. That is what I'm talking about. Okay. So, um, <laughs> identification is us, me. So Christ died. 
as me. Substitution is Christ died for me. But then baptism is Christ died with me. We died together. So Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 6. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 6. It says, and has raised us up together. Let's read from verse 4 so that we understand even better. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love with the lambdas, even when we're dead in sins, has he made us alive together with Christ? He made us alive or he quickened us together. Say together. together. With Christ. Christ. For by grace are ye saved. Then he says, and has raised us up together. So it is together. This is our baptism. It's a sign of our baptism. Are you here? Yes. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It is together. So baptism is with Christ. Identification is as me. Christ died as me. And then substitution is Christ died for me. Are you seeing it? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go to Romans chapter 6 from verse 1. Let me show you some more. Romans chapter 6 from verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that many, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. This is the baptism into Christ. It says we're baptized into his death. Next verse. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Are you seeing it? It says for, go back, go go to verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus, were baptized into Christ, into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Who raised Jesus up from the dead? It was the Holy Spirit who did that. Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans chapter 8. Let's read verse 11. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead, Jesus from the dead, dwell in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit which that dwelleth in you. So the Holy Spirit is the one who did the raising up of Christ. Are you saying it? So the Holy Spirit is the agent for this particular baptism. So if I ask you, who is the baptizer? Who is the baptizer for this kind of baptism? It's the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who raised Jesus up from the dead. Are you saying it? And he's the one who immerses us into the body of Christ. Like I showed you. Who is the baptizee? Who is the baptizee? All believers. Anyone who is born again is the baptizee. All believers are baptizees of this particular kind of baptism. This is our new birth. Okay? Who is, what is the medium? What is the medium? What is the medium? It cannot be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the medium. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is the medium. Jesus is the medium through which we are baptized. The Holy Spirit is the baptizer. He does the baptism. He's the one who gives birth to us and puts us into the body of Christ. But the medium for that to happen is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Without Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, you cannot be born again. What do we believe to be able to be born again? We believe his death, that he died. And that when he died, he didn't just die. He didn't stay there. He was buried and he was raised from the dead. Go back to Romans chapter 10. Let's read verse 9 once again. He says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has what? Raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. You must believe that God raised him from the dead. So if you just believe in his death, if you just believe that God exists, you have not done much. Believing that God exists is not much. The Bible says that even the demons believe and they tremble. So believing is not enough. You must believe and confess. It's very important. What do you confess? You confess his lordship over your life and you believe the fact that God raised him from the dead. So the medium for our baptism into Christ is Christ's death. His burial and his what? His resurrection. Hallelujah. 
Unto what are we baptized? We are baptized into the body of Christ. We are baptized into the body of Christ. Now we are members of the body of Christ. That is why if someone touches you in a wrong way, he has touched God. So there was a day in uh, Acts chapter 9 when Paul was persecuting the church. Okay, It started from Acts chapter 7. He, he, he assisted in Stephen's uh, uh, stoning to death. The Bible says that those who were stoning Stephen had their clothes at uh, Paul's feet. And he was witnessing, he was testifying to it against Stephen. And after Stephen's death, Paul, who was then at that time called Saul, took letters from the high priest and held so many people into prison, so many children of God into prison, killing some. Well, he, the Bible says he worked, he wrote havoc to the church. Havoc, that's the word that is used. Eh? Havoc. Acts chapter 8, look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And so was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered about throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. I said the apostles, verse 2. And devout men cast him into his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Do you understand that? He made havoc of the church. Entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. He was, it was not easy for the children of God at all because of Paul. Who was then called Saul? Look at chapter 9, verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1. And so, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. He was breathing what? Threatenings and slaughter. He was killing them. He went to the high priest and sought God letters because he had arrested so many in Israel, in Jerusalem. He needed to go to another country. So he was on his way to Syria, Damascus, to go and arrest more Christians and kill them. That if he found any of the way there, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shine round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, So, so, why persecutest thou? Me. Why persecutest thou? Me. Who was the one talking? Jesus was the one talking. How come Jesus said to Saul, So, so, why persecutest thou me? Was Jesus there when Paul was Saul was persecuting the church? He had died and gone a long time. In fact, it is said that Saul never met Jesus. He never did. He never did. They never met. Not naturally. They never met. And even he confirms it to himself. Hence for knowing no man after the flesh. I didn't know Christ after the flesh. He didn't know him. But he was persecuting the church so much. Jesus came and said that, Why persecutest Saul? Saul, Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for you to kick against the gonads or the pricks or uh, 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 nails. How can you be kicking against nails? Who will get hurt? You will get hurt, isn't it? You will get hurt. So Jesus told him, you are persecuting me. Even though he was persecuting the church, Jesus said he was persecuting him. Why? Because we are so identified with Christ. We are so in Christ. We are in Christ. Say we are in Christ. Christ. So if someone touches you, tell your neighbor, so if someone touches you, he has touched Christ himself. And he will not, it will not be easy for him. The Bible says that husbands love their wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Then he goes on and says, For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as Christ does also the church. So Christ nourishes the church and he cherishes the church. Christ loves you with a love that cannot be uh, taught about. Nobody can love you like that. Your wife, your husband cannot love you like that. The Bible says that he cares for you affectionately and watchfully. If someone slaps you, he has slapped Jesus. That's what it means. If someone breaks your heart, he has broken the heart of Jesus. Hey. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you in the church? Yeah. So this is the baptism into Christ. The baptizer is who? The baptizers are all believers. The medium is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And we are baptized onto or into the body of Christ. Please, do you understand that one? So can we move on to the third one? What's the third one? Water baptism, isn't it? Number three. Water baptism. Remember, there are six, so we want to go through all of them. There's a nice example here, but I don't know if I should say it. 
concerning the same one. But do you understand it? Okay, let me show you that. I think this, this will be good for you to help you. First Peter chapter 3, verse 19 and verse 20. There's a type, there's an example of um, our baptism into Christ. Okay, over here in First Peter 3, 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. Are you saying it? What he's saying is that you see, Noah built an ark. Now, if you look at the dimension of the ark, you realize that it's the dimensions of Christ, actually, but I won't go into it. And his family went into the ark. When they went into the ark, some people didn't enter the ark. Only eight people entered the, entered the ark. Now the ark, of, the ark, that ark, Noah's ark, went through the sea. It was buried in the sea, in the water that came, the great deluge. It, it went inside, and it came out of it. And then at the end of the day, it settled on a mountain called Mount Ararat, which represents resurrection. Okay. Now what is he saying? What he's saying is this: that. Uh, the eight souls, the eight people were in the ark of they were in the ark of Noah. They didn't know what was going on. It was the ark that went through the sea. It was the ark that suffered. The ark suffered the, the beatings of the water, the rain, everything. Went through the water, was buried in there, came out, and then sat on Mount Ararat. The eight souls were only in the ark of Noah. So just as you weren't there when Adam sinned. The eight souls had nothing to do with the ark, what that the ark did. They were just inside the ark. And all that the ark did was accounted as their death, burial, and resurrection. Are you seeing it? Yeah. Hmm. So just as you end there when Adam was eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, but you know that you are a sinner because you are born of Adam. In the same way, the second Adam, who is Christ, who is Jesus, the second and the last Adam, who is Jesus, was also made someone who could contain all of humanity. So he tasted death for every one of us. So his death was the death of all of humanity. His burial was the burial of all of humanity. His resurrection was the resurrection of all of humanity. Just like Noah's Ark. I see it. All right. So that is for that one. So let's move on to the next one. Since we understand this one, let's go to water baptism. Water baptism. That's where the confusion is. So I want to help you with it. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Mark chapter 15, 16, verse 15. Mark 16, 15. Mark 1, 6, 1, 5. This is Jesus before he left the earth. Okay? And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Next verse. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Have you seen it? How do you understand this verse? It makes us look as though if you are not baptized, you will not be saved, isn't it? It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, look at this very carefully. He didn't say, He that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. We all know that our salvation has nothing to do with the natural baptism, with water baptism. I just showed it to you. It has to do with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a baptizer. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is what qualifies you. There's nowhere in the Bible where the Bible talks about the fact that baptism is what will save you, take you to heaven, or bring you eternal life. Do you understand? Yeah. Romans, uh, sorry, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, that is why he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Did he say whosoever believes and is baptized should not ber- perish? He didn't say that. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life or everlasting life. Are you here? Uh-huh. So everlasting life is not what he's talking about here. The salvation here is not the eternal life type of salvation. The eternal life type of salvation is not what is being mentioned here. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. He's talking about, you see, salvation uh, is broader in scope in terms of use than eternal life. The word salvation here is sozo, S-O-Z-O. Sozo, it means deliverance. 
He means to be delivered. He means to be uh, rescued, to be healed, to be taken from captivity. Okay? But eternal life is specific. Eternal life has to do, eternal life has to do with only one thing. It, if you are given eternal life, it means that you've missed the coming judgment. And hence you've missed something called death. Which results, if you miss eternal life, the end, your end will be the lake of fire. So eternal life is specific. Eternal life is opposite. The opposite of eternal life is death. Which is the lake of fire. But the opposite of salvation is not death. If you are holding him in captivity, come, that's what we should come. Hold him like bam no, no, bam no, like you are beating him. Some fight is going on. This guy is losing. And I'm a big man, I'm a bullet. So I come in, then I beat this guy. Go away, go away. <laughs> then I take him. What have I done? I have saved him yeah. from him. Yeah. Has it got anything to do with salvation? Uh, with eternal life? It has nothing to do with eternal life. Eternal, salvation has a broader use. You understand? It has a broader use. And a broader scope. And salvation is always from something into something. He was saved. I saved him from beatings and knockings into freedom. freedom. <laughs> Not a shatawali type. <laughs> into freedom. I see again. Uh huh. But eternal life is with one reference. Eternal life is only into something, not from something. Eternal life is into life. But it has no reference with from something. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Uh huh. So what is? Thank you very much. Let's get our applause as they sit down. So what Jesus was talking about here is a certain type of salvation that we need to look at. Okay, that we need to look at. And to explain it very well to you, what about this is very important. Those of you who don't play what about this is very important because there's a, there's a certain salvation it comes with. There's a certain salvation. You are taken from something into another thing. Okay? Apart from the fact that water baptism is an outward testimony or an outward acclamation of what has happened spiritually. What we read in Romans chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 4, if you remember. Let's read from verse 3. Romans 6 from verse 3 to verse 4. Knowing not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Have you seen it? Therefore, we abide with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. This is the spiritual aspect. I've defined it for you. But there's a physical aspect where this particular thing is represented outwardly. So when they immerse you into the water, it means that you have died with Christ. And you have been buried with Christ. When they bring you out, it means that you have been brought into life, into resurrection. Do you understand? That is a so water baptism is a physical representation of the spiritual fact of our new birth. That's the first thing that water baptism represents. However, there's more. So first Corinthians chapter 10. Let's look at first Corinthians chapter 10. Let's read from verse 1 so that you understand it even some more. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Do you remember this people? He's talking about the children of Israel. He says they were all under the cloud. What is the cloud? The cloud. So this baptism, baptism into Christ is also known as baptism out of the cloud. Okay? It's the same thing. But I didn't say it. I'm saying it now. How that all our fathers were under the cloud... That represents a new birth. And we're all, we're all, they all pass through the sea. Verse 2. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud. I told you cloud represents baptism into Christ, right? And into and in the sea. The sea represents our water baptism. Exodus chapter 12. Now, if you read Exodus chapter 12, you realize that... Um, before the children of Israel left Egypt, there were things that Jesus, God told them to do. Exodus chapter 12. You can, you can go there as I'm talking about. You can just be going from verse 1. 
God told them that they should kill a lamb before they left Egypt. The night before they left Egypt, God told them, kill a lamb and use the blood to mark your, your, your doorposts and eat the lamb. Roast it and eat it with bitter herbs. Okay? Eat it dressed as though you are on a journey because you are going to be going on a long journey. Now, the lamb that they killed the lamb that they killed represents Christ okay Jesus said except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink the blood of the son of man ye have no eternal life in you so the lamb that they partook of that they ate of is Christ so they received Christ into them typologically symbolically do you understand yeah. remember that all the things of the old testament have as uh, 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 the reality in the new i mean if i had your picture before i met you and i was always relating to the picture talking to the picture and saying how i've missed this person and you finally come do i still look at the picture whilst you're standing there the picture and the person who is more important the person is not so i threw the picture away i hugged the person whatever i have to do with the person i will do with the person isn't it? yeah you don't continue kissing the picture when the human being is there. I mean, your wife has come. Oh, relax, I said wife. Your wife has come. You have been looking at the picture all this while. Now the wife has come. What do you, what do you think? Throw away the picture. Let's relate physically. So Christ is the reality. All those things were pictures of Christ. God bless you for listening. Keep listening to the word as Christ is made the center of your world.